The basis of successful convoy escort lies in the closest cooperation between the sea and air forces engaged on convoy duty. The Southwest Pacific area is well situated for cooperation between the Navy and the Air Force. The main coastal convoy routes are well covered by shore-based aircraft and there is no problem similar to the Mid-Atlantic Gap where for a long time air cover was almost impossible. To achieve successful cooperation, naval escorts must understand the capabilities and appreciate the difficulties of the aerial escorts. And all Air Force personnel must know what the Navy can do and what problems it has to face. All the convoy escorts must learn to appreciate the other fellow's point of view, bearing in mind that cooperation means success. The primary object of all escorts engaged on convoy duties is the safe and timely arrival of the merchant ships at their destination. Our job is to provide the close escort. The warships are placed round the convoy so that they can locate and attack or discourage any submarines which may be attempting to make a submerged attack. The role of the aircraft is to patrol and search the area further distant from the convoy where submarines are more likely to operate on the surface, either lying in wait for a convoy or attempting to make a surfaced interception out of sight. Briefly, our job is to provide long-range eyes for the convoy, to give the alarm and to attack. Of course, your method of escorting varies with the number of warships available. Yes, the positions for various numbers of escorts are laid down in our convoy escort diagrams. The warships are situated usually about 4,000 yards from the convoy in daylight and about 5,000 yards at night. The range of ASDIC detection of submarines varies with the weather conditions, but we can be fairly confident of gaining contact at about 1,500 yards. Sometimes it may be 2,500 yards. This means that the submarine should be detected before it's in a position most favorable for firing torpedoes at the convoy. Although a U-boat could still fire at long range from outside the screen. AS escorts usually zigzag about their position to increase the effectiveness of the screen. The distance at which the masthead lookout can sight a surface submarine varies with the weather too. In maximum visibility, he could probably sight a fully surfaced submarine at about 10 miles. Sighting the periscope of a submarine is a difficult matter in any sort of sea, and no ship could guarantee more than a couple of hundred yards. A bright flash of reflected sunlight on a periscope has sometimes disclosed the presence of a submarine at longer distances. However, detection of surface submarines, especially at night, will be much improved when all of our escorts have radar. Not all of our escorts have radar yet, and of course the performance of the sets varies considerably. Our methods of patrol and search depend largely on visibility. If the visibility is good, the patrol is carried out with the naked eye and with binoculars. In bad visibility or at night, the patrol is carried out almost entirely on radar. With the naked eye, it is possible to sight fully surface submarines at a distance of 20 miles or even more in excellent visibility. With good binoculars, they have been picked out by keen lookouts at a distance of 25 or even 28 miles. Radar picks up submarines at distances between 8 and 20 miles dependent on the size of the submarine, conditions generally, and the skill of the operator. In addition, although an aircraft rarely sights a submerged submarine, the mere presence of the aircraft keeps the submarine from surfacing, so preventing it from approaching close enough to the convoy to make an attack. All our night aircraft are fitted with radar and some of our day aircraft. Our aircraft's main weapon, in addition to their machine guns, is the 250-pound depth charge though we would use 250-pound anti-submarine bombs for surface submarines if possible. Our aircraft carry a load of two to six depth charges, depending on the type of aircraft. Normally, when attacking, we will release the whole load in one stick. Your weapons, of course, are bigger and better. Yes. Most ships carry over 40 depth charges. Some of the larger escorts carry 100 and are also being equipped with weapons which throw small contact charges ahead of the attacking ship. The aircraft has to make a real lightning attack. We cannot hunt the submarine while it is submerged, so we must attack him while he is on the surface, or before he has been submerged for more than 30 seconds. After that period, our depth charges may fall very wide of the mark, because we have no means of telling which way the enemy has turned or how deep he is.
I suppose your attacks are invariably dependent on ASDIC. Well, if we obtain an ASDIC contact, we have to classify it. Because we can get echoes of rocks and fish, the same as an aircraft can get ASV blips off land. These blokes cause all sorts of whistles and squeaks. If an escort obtains a contact which may possibly be a submarine, and which would be an immediate danger to the convoy, the attack begins immediately, and an attempt is made to classify the echo as submarine or non-submarine on the way in. We call this counter-attack. If the submarine is not an immediate danger to the convoy, a deliberate attack is carried out. In this case, the submarine's course and speed are estimated accurately before the attack begins, and the attack itself is carried out much more deliberately, hence the title. In some ways, the fact that Japanese submarines run to very large sizes is an advantage when considering the aircraft's power to attack. These 2,000-odd tonners generally take a little longer to submerge, and those few seconds mean a lot to an aircraft racing to attack from some miles away. Yes, and the ocean-going ones that have been active off the Australian coast are over 300 feet long and have a displacement of more than 2,000 tons. This 2,000-tonner carries one or two five or five five-inch guns and also carries machine guns too. There are, of course, smaller ones of the 500-ton class, like the RO-100s. Yes, during 1943, German U-boats were fitted with heavier and more numerous anti-aircraft guns, and they changed their tactics. Previously, they crashed dive immediately on sighting an aircraft, but now they remain on the surface and fight it out, even when attacked by two or three aircraft at a time. The Japanese, however, have not yet followed the German example. And so far, we have found the Japanese submarines crash dive invariably when we attack. We prefer them to dive, of course, because the newer submarines can do 24 knots on the surface, and that's too good for our smaller escorts. When the submarine submerges, its speed is generally cut down to a maximum of less than 10 knots. And as the batteries won't stand up to many hours at that speed, we reckon on them averaging about 2 to 5 knots. As far as underwater endurance is concerned, a British submarine recently stayed submerged for 36 hours while being hunted, and the crew were feeling pretty sick when they eventually surfaced. I don't think the Japanese could stay down much longer than that. If they did, they'd certainly be feeling like committing harikari. Although we haven't a great deal of information about the Japanese U-boat's methods, because they've made relatively few attacks, there is some evidence to suggest that they like to get into a firing position about 70 degrees on the bow of the convoy. We believe that they've made off immediately after their attack, and never yet has the same convoy been attacked twice by the same submarine. Now that is where an aircraft can help a good deal, by cooperating with the warships after a submarine has attacked the convoy. You cannot see a distant torpedo track from the bridge of a ship, but an aircraft has a much better view, and if it's within a couple of miles of the scene, the crew can frequently see the entire length of the torpedo track, although it gets a little faint towards the end from where it was fired from the submarine. Our action is instantaneous. The aircraft dives directly at the spot, firing white or yellow very lights, and will then drop a depth charge and an aluminium sea marker on the end of the visible portion, so as to draw attention to and mark the exact spot from where the attack was launched. At the same time, the aircraft will signal by WT and also on VS in order to make matters quite clear. This rapid cooperation is just what we want to assist warships which may be two or three miles away and therefore have no indication as to where to start their ASDIC sweeps. The main problem seems to be to ensure maximum cooperation between ships and aircraft. Yes, and you cannot have maximum cooperation if there are any faults in the communication. Faulty communications are certainly likely to reduce the chance of a kill. There are difficulties in signaling between ships and aircraft, and although the use of RT eliminates some of the trouble, RT sets are rarely 100% efficient, and it would be a mistake to rely on them implicitly. It's essential that RT discipline should be strictly enforced. Only important information should be passed and talk should be reduced to a minimum. However, communication should not break down if an alert watch is kept on the convoy reco frequency. Our escorting aircraft keep a watch on the convoy frequency and so does the AOR and one of your ships. Small escorts can't carry enough WT ratings to keep more than one line manned 24 hours a day. The ships, therefore, split up the watch between them. One escort guards bells, the wave on which they get messages from naval authorities ashore. Another looks after the commercial distress wave. 
A third guards the convoy wrecker wave. In addition, all escorts keep loudspeaker watch on convoy RT. When the convoy wrecker guard receives a message, he can immediately pass it to the rest of the escorts by RT or VS. Everything should work perfectly, provided there's strong liaison between the Navy and Air Force shore authorities. Now, what actually happens when an air escort sights a submarine in the vicinity of a convoy? Well, the pilot's first job is to attack the U-boat. Besides dropping bombs and depth charges, the aircraft also drops smoke floats or sea markers to mark the last known position of the submarine. The wireless air gunner makes an enemy sighting report on convoy wrecker wave and repeats this until he is answered, first by the ship guarding that frequency and then by his own base. As far as the shore authorities are concerned, they receive the enemy report, pass it to the AOR and the local NOIC is informed by the quickest possible method, usually by telephone. I suppose your surface escorts work along similar lines when they sight a submarine. Yes. The senior officer of escort sends off an enemy report on ship shore frequency immediately the submarine is sighted. The convoy reco guard transmits the report on convoy reco frequency so that the aircraft and the Air Force shore WT stations also receive the information. The senior officer's enemy report is received by the shore WT station, decoded, and passed to the naval officer in charge and to the commander, Southwest Pacific Sea Frontiers. The naval officer in charge telephones the air operations room immediately to make sure they've received the report, and he also telephones details of the ship's amplifying report when he receives it. The naval officer in charge and the air operations officer collaborate closely. They may decide to organize an AS hunt. If so, the ships detached from the escort to hunt may be ordered by shore authorities to change to hunting reco frequency. The aircraft detailed to continue the hunt will be briefed to guard the same hunting reco frequency with the hunting ships. The other escorts, which are still with the convoy, reorganize their WT watchkeeping duties so that watch is kept on bells, the convoy reco frequency, and if possible, the commercial distress wave. As far as the hunting units are concerned, wireless silence is relaxed, and they can talk to each other on the HR frequency while still leaving the convoy reco frequency clear. Speed and accuracy and communications and close cooperation between sea and air are vitally important. There was a good example of successful cooperation in the case of the attack on the submarine which sank a straggler from BR-100. Convoy BR-100 is ready to sail. In air operations room, the naval liaison fills in particulars of shipping requiring aerial escort. The naval escorts for BR-100 have already been detailed by the NOIC and the merchant ships have indicated that they will be ready to sail. The controller studies the route of the convoy to decide from which basis he'll send out aircraft escort. rings the bases to warn them of the impending operation. They change to Secrophone and the information is passed to the ops officer at the base. It is subsequently confirmed by Form Green. From the Form Green, the ops officer plots the course to be flown by aircraft. A few hours before the sailing time of the convoy, the naval control officer holds a meeting of the convoy captains. Officers of the naval escort vessels attend this meeting, and if convenient, the aircraft captains as well. The naval control officer tells the masters that intelligence reports indicate that Japanese submarines are operating off the coast. The captain of the air escort explains the W patrol, as some of the masters think that because they don't see the aircraft, they have no air escort. The aircraft, of course, patrol well ahead of the convoy. Back at the airbase, the ground staff are bombing up. Before taking off, the air crew visit operations room for their briefing. All the information they can possibly need in the operation is included in their brief.
They study the positions at which they can expect to join and leave the convoy. And the intelligence officer has pictures for them of all the ships that will be in the convoy. Merchant ships cast off and head for the ocean. The convoy leaders first, for although the ships will not take up their convoy formation until they're some miles at sea, they begin manoeuvring to get into stations from the time they cast off. As the ships steam from harbour, the masters wonder if they'll meet those U-boats. They know they're prowling somewhere off the coast. is off to keep its appointment with the convoy. The convoy has almost reached the forming up point and is taking up station. The escorts have been out for some time looking for prowlers and now they too take up station. The escort aircraft sight their convoy and approaching to a mile from the senior escort vessel, fire their recognition signal. The navigator counts the flock to make sure all the ships are present. While the convoy steams ahead on its course, the escort vessels zigzag around the merchant ships with lookouts on the alert. The ASDIC and radar operators are constantly on duty, sweeping the sea, searching for U-boats. Here he is, the Jap submarine, waiting off the coast until he sights one of our convoys. Over the horizon, the skipper sees the smoke of the approaching convoy BR-100. He'll have to travel at top speed some miles westward to bring the convoy into easy range. To do this, it'll be necessary to surface. As he surfaces, he sights the aircraft escort and dives. The navigator sights a disturbance in the ocean some miles off. He informs the captain and they immediately dive to investigate. By the time they've arrived in the vicinity of the submarine, all traces of it have disappeared. The crew decide that it was possibly a breaking wave or a whale that was sighted. The aircraft continues on its patrol. The Jap skipper can now see the convoy in full view but he knows that without surfacing, he cannot get the convoy within certain range. Swinging his periscope astern of the convoy, the Jap sees a sight that gladdens his heart, a straggler lagging some miles behind. He can get within range of the straggler without surfacing, so he sets his course for the attack. It is time for the aircraft to make its routine patrol astern of the convoy.
straggler plods blissfully ahead, while the Jap skipper lines her up at his periscope sights. At last, the straggler is within easy range, and the torpedo is fired. It travels at 30 knots, leaving a trail of bubbles on the surface. The air escort sights these bubbles and immediately turns down the wake in the direction from which the torpedo has come. The captain warns the crew that they're making an attack and the navigator comes forward to assist him. The torpedo travels on and finds its mark. But the Japanese captain will pay a heavy price for his curiosity. The aircraft has sighted him. The navigator counts the seconds from the time the periscope disappears. Four, five, six, seven. Bomb's gone. The submarine is shaken, but it's not a kill. Naval escorts have sighted the torpedoed straggler and the aircraft's attack. The aircraft drops a smoke float to mark the last position of the submarine. The captain orders Operation Artichoke. Action stations are sounded, and as the vessels alter course, the crews take up their positions. The second escort is ordered to join in the attack, and all ships go to action stations. In the meantime, an escort has located the U-boat with Asli, and is moving in to attack. Echo bearing, red one out, sir. Range 2300, sir. Foot 10. Pass to escort, submarine contact bearing, 240, range 2300. Midship, steer 240. Right on 246, target drawing right. Echo slide well, now. Ship, submarine Four, ordering two, course four, to starboard, oh. sir. Pass to depth charges. Set one pattern to see for Charlie. One pattern to see for Charlie. <laughs> Left crown 252, bearing drawing left, echo slight high. Range 400, sir. Stand by to drop depth charges. Steer 5 degrees to port. Range 200, sir. Instant echoes. One engine room to stand by, dropping depth charges. Box step. Fire one.
There's a sight we all hope to see one day. Until then, good hunting.